Good morning, and it's a joy to welcome you to worship this morning as we gather to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For Christ is in this place. He comes to be a part of our lives here in the sanctuary and wherever you are worshiping. Because He loves for us to worship with Him. We thank you for joining us, those of you who are watching through the internet. This service is being pre-recorded. We will not have in-person worship on October the uh, October the 4th, and we will be celebrating Worldwide Communion this morning, so if you have uh, not gotten some juice and bread together for the communion service at the end of the service, I hope you will take a moment and do that sometime during the service. Also, uh, we have a new sermon series that will start next week on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the, how that will be broken down over the next eight weeks is in the bulletin. And if you're not getting the bulletin, reach out to me through the website and I will add you to our email list so we can send you that and scriptures and prayers on a regular basis to lift you up and encourage you during this time of pandemic and search for justice in our country. At this time, Lisa Robinson is going to share with us an announcement about blessings in a backpack. Good morning. Um, we're collecting again this week for blessings in a backpack. Um, for those of you all that are not familiar with it, um, it covers our, a large amount of our community. It takes about $110 to sponsor a kid for an entire year. Um, basically, they get a backpack on Friday to take home with them with uh, things that can be prepared in the microwave, snack things that they can eat over the weekend when they're not at school. Um, if you'd like to give, you can do so by going on the website and whenever you, like you make your donation, in the comment line, just put blessings in a backpack or in your memo line of your check, put blessings in a backpack and send it in and we'll get it that way as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. Hope you will support blessings in a backpack. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we come to you from many different places this morning to worship and praise you. We ask, Lord, that you will bless us in this time of worship and praise. Bless our songs, bless our prayers, bless the reading of Scripture and the sermon. We pray, Lord, that all we do and say this morning will glorify your name and we ask that you will bless each one of us with holy protection wherever we're worshiping from. Holy Spirit, come and dwell in that place and cleanse it of all evil and darkness so that each of us can worship you and praise you without hindrance uh, in the part of Satan. We lift it all up in the name of Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. So this morning's service is Worldwide Communion Service and the music has all been selected from places around the world. Our opening music includes How Great Thou Art, which is a Swedish folk melody, uh, in Christ there is no east or west, which is, which is an African-American spiritual. And Lord, you have come to the lake shore, which is a Spanish melody. Join with me in, in singing our opening music. Oh Lord. 
Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook, and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art.
have come up to the lake shore, looking neither for wives nor for wealthy. You only wanted that I should follow. Oh Lord, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling have called out my shoreline behind me. Now with you, I will seek other seas. You know that I am so little. In my boat there's no money nor weapons. You'll only find there my nets and shoreline behind me. Now with you, I will seek other seas. You need the caring of my hands. Through my tiredness, may others my breast be. You need a love that just goes on loving. smiling have called out my name now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me now with you I will see other seas you who have fished other oceans ever long my souls that are waiting, my dear and good friend, as thus you call me. Oh Lord, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling have called out my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. Now with you, I will seek other seas. We now come to our scripture reading for the morning. If you got the bulletin, you got a text from Luke. That is not the scripture reading. We are going to read from the letter to the church in Rome. I'm sorry, the letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to begin on verse 16. This is a powerful text for us to uh, remember whenever a loved one dies. Our sermon title today is Slaying the Goliath of Death. And death is a frightening thing for a lot of people. And so this is one of those promises of Scripture. That at death, we need not be afraid. Let us bow our heads in prayer as we turn to the holy word of God and consider what God, God's promises at death. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Convict. Convert. Consecrate us until we are fully and completely yours. That through the power of your holy word, we may learn to celebrate life and death, and the life everlasting that follows. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Beginning on verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 15. Let us listen to the word of God. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost as well. 
If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then we jump ahead to verse uh, 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It is the word of God. I bid you take it and use it. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join me now as we share the prayer of confession as it is printed on the screen. We bow before the Lord, believing that God hears all of our uh, prayers of confession and he forgives us of all of our sins. Let us bow our heads and pray together. Let us pray. Eternal God of all people and places, we confess to you our lack of oneness with our human sisters and brothers as we begin this celebration of unity in Christ. We have closed our ears to the voices of wisdom when they speak in accents other than our own. We have reserved the right to judge whether to accept fellowship with denominations different from our own. Gracious God, forgive us and fill us with the vision of unity in Christ. Amen. I invite us all now to take a time of silent confession let us pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Our scripture from 1 Corinthians tells us that something miraculous happens to us when we die in this life. We're given a new body fitted for the resurrection life. This new body assures us that Christ has been raised and God's going to do the same thing for Jesus that he did for us. Or he's going to do the same thing for us that he did for Jesus. That we have the victory over sin and death and evil through the cross of Christ when he died for our sins and our salvation and through his resurrection from the dead. People of God, hear the good news. Our sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Amen. We now come to our time of offering. Uh, we invite folks to take this time and if you'd like to make a gift through the website, uh, Go to the home page and click gift in the upper right hand corner or prepare your gift to the church by mail uh, at this time. Please join me now as we share the offering prayer as it comes up on the screen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, 
thank you that you have plans for me that are for my good and your glory. You said, give and it will be given to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and continue to supply all our needs. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace be in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our souls. In your mighty name, amen. now come to our time of prayer for ourselves and for others. On the day that we pre-recorded this service, it was before decisions had been announced publicly on behalf of how uh, the, the case of Brianna Taylor uh, would be handled. And um, there is lots of concern, even fear and anxiety over what's going to happen in the city of Louisville. Uh, for uh, for the police officers that were involved in the case, uh, the people and their response to the decisions uh, by the state on how to handle it. And all of those things are wrapped up in the concerns for racial justice across our land and all of the uh, violent uh, riots that have sprung up night in and night out across our country. This is called Worldwide Communion Sunday. It's a a Sunday that we have celebrated uh, that Christians from all around the world gather around the table of our Lord and are brought together in unity. And yet, uh, as we await the decision of the state how to handle the Breonna Taylor case, the fear of disunity, of racial discord and violence uh, strikes many. And so that's the prayer I want to lift up. I don't know Uh, on this morning when you're watching this, uh, what will have transpired between the taping of this service and the service itself. But uh, anytime we pray for racial justice, especially on Worldwide Communion Sunday, it is a good prayer. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Great and glorious God, we know that you love color that you have made your human creation, each person, a wonderful rainbow of colors, and you love us all, all races, across this world. You are our creator, and the color of our skin has no bearing on faith, salvation, the gates of heaven being opened, And the receiving of your love. Your love is perfect. It knows no bounds. But Lord, we are imperfect. And so often, too often, our love is unconditional. 
Our understanding of justice and injustice is so imperfect. And we live in a fallen world of, of greed and search for power and racial prejudice. And we have seen the sins of humanity on parade. Since the death of George Floyd. Oh Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for all the ways that we have messed up your beautiful creation. Lord, call us to come in humility and penitence. To your throne to prepare ourselves. To have hearts of love and compassion and unity with our fellow brothers and sisters of all faiths, creeds, and colors. Remind us as Christians that there is no place for racial prejudice. And if we struggle in any way with racial prejudice, then Lord, I ask that you will expose those struggles and, and drive us to our knee, knees in humility. Oh Lord, I pray for our country in this very difficult time when we balance all the struggles that our country is facing. The struggles of the pandemic, good health, safety, the struggles of liberty and freedom, the struggles of racial justice, rioting and looting in our urban areas, and even spreading into the smaller communities of the United States. Bless our elected officials with wisdom and insight as they try to guide our nation to that place of liberty and freedom and peace, that our communities are safe and just for all people. I say a special prayer today for Mayor Greg Fisher. As the city of Louisville has begun dealing with the decisions that I don't know about today. And I pray that, Lord, you have intervened and will intervene in the affairs of men to bring peace and justice, to remove violence and anger, to bring humility and penitence, to remove hatred and injustice. O oh Lord, I ask this prayer in the precious name of Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. We need peace today as much as any of us can ever remember. And we go, join together to pray the prayer Christ has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive, forgive us our debts, debts as we forgive, forgive our debtors. debtors. And lead us not, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. forever. Amen. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet and any time that I don't know what to do I will cast all my cares upon you Amen Please join me in a word of prayer Let us pray O oh Lord I ask that the words of my mouth the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight as we come before you, Lord. Bless us with wisdom and insight as we reflect upon our understanding of death and life eternal and what all that means for our day-to-day -day lives. Lord, bless us with your spirit of wisdom and insight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the final sermon in our uh, series on the things that hold us back as disciples. And tonight we're going to slay the, the Goliath of death. He is a giant indeed. A lot of Americans are terrified 
of death, more so than any other time in my, in, uh, my ministry. And I think the reason is so many people are trying to navigate through life and death without God. And i got to be honest with you, if you're trying to da- navigate through life and death without God, then that is going to be a terrible struggle indeed. When people have come to me in ministry and, and, I have, uh, and they're, they're going through the dying process or a loved one of theirs is going through the dying process and I will minister to them and help them with the struggle and they say, I don't believe in God, it becomes a very pitiful discussion. There is so little I have to offer them because I can't offer them the word of God and the promises in Scripture. Now, we as disciples, we have a a lot of things that God wants us to know about life and death and life eternal. And he wants us to know these things so that we are not stymied in our discipleship journey by fears of death. There is no reason to be afraid of death. And most Christians need to come to that place. And I think we get we get confused because death is a sad time. And this is and grief is normal. Um, we, we encounter death when a loved one dies. It seems to be a lot harder for us than when we think about our own deaths. I know when I think about my wife's death, I would just prefer to die before her and not have to deal with that. And, and that's a normal thing. That's more in the area of grief when we have to deal with someone else's death, a spouse, a a parent. uh, When somebody lives a normal life, a full life, a a, a life uh, of many years, then it's a lot easier to say goodbye and celebrate their life and, 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 and believe that they are in heaven with God, enjoying the life eternal God has prepared for them. Uh, but when someone dies out of order like a child, it's a devastating experience and it and ingrains in us a fear of death. That is not natural. I think that's part of what Satan does is he takes that fear of death and he and he puts it upon us and he whispers those things to us like um, death is a terrible thing. You cannot survive it. The grief will be unbearable. The sadness you're going to feel is going to just overwhelm you and those kinds of things. Grief is normal. When we walk through the uh, valley of the shadow of death with God, we need not fear evil for God is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. God gives us good grief. He heals us and takes care of us. He loves us so much. And so the, the first thing that disciples need to remember is that there are many promises in Scripture about dying and death that we have to hold on to. I know that uh, when a friend dies, I'm sorry, when a, a fr- in, my, in my age group, when one of my friend's parents die or I'm asked to do a funeral, I love to remind people of the promises of Scripture in, at death because it's quick, quickly forgotten. We cannot remind ourselves over and over again enough the promises God gives us so that we need not fear God as we go on the journey of discipleship. Some of the, uh, the, the promises that I love to lift up at death include, um, in my father's house, there are many rooms. That is, Jesus has gone ahead, he says in John 14, 1 through 7, I have gone ahead to prepare a room for you. And where I go, I will come again and lead you to where I am. And so that promise of of entry into the house of many rooms, King David echoes in Psalm 23 when he says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever at the end of Psalm 23. This is a promise for us that there is a house of many rooms, that God does have a plan for the next life and that we're going to go. There's always a room for us when we are in the Lord in his mansion in heaven. Another scripture that I, I love to lift up is the scripture that I read today from 1 Corinthians 15. The part that I didn't read is Paul's explanation of of the resurrection body that God gives us. He says it's like a seed. You take a seed, you put it in the ground, and what comes up? Not seeds. A plant grows up. The seed must die, and then it yields a new plant. And every seed 
has its own plant. He says in the resurrection body, our bodies, these mortal bodies, must take on immortality. These perishable bodies must take on uh, imperishable, imperishability. And so like Jesus, who received a resurrection body, at his resurrection, a body fitted for the resurrection life for eternity with God, so God promises to give us a resurrection body. When this body dies, it will yield to a new body fitted for the resurrection life. It's an unbelievable promise that he will give to us what he has given to his very own son, uh, the resurrection body. Uh, the third promise of Scripture that I, I want to lift up today is um, oh, I got my pages out of order. Excuse me. Oh, can't believe I forgot it. It's one of my favorite scriptures. It comes from Romans eight, chapter uh, verses thirty one through thirty nine, and it concludes with uh, Romans eight thirty nine. And, 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 then, and then that Paul says, nothing, nothing from on high, nothing from below, nothing, uh, nothing on earth, no powers, no uh, peril can separate us from the love of God, which is ours in Christ Jesus, especially death. Death does not separate us from the love of God, which is ours in Christ Jesus. And that is a, another amazing promise that tells us we do not have to be afraid of death. So this is the first thing that I want to lift up for us as disciples. We need not be afraid of death and we need not be afraid of grief. It's God's good gift to help us heal from the losses that are meaningful to us and the sadness that we bear when we say goodbye to those that are close to us. But then I want to focus on some other things that uh, are very much a part of how God deals with his disciples in the journey of faith and that death is only a uh, a, a, a move from, from this life through death into the life eternal. And what happens in this life has an effect on life eternal. And death is only that marker to move from, the, from one life to the next life. The first thing I think we need to remember is that time is a, something God gives you and I so that we can mark uh, our lives. God doesn't live in time. For God, there is no night or day. There is no 24-7, 365. God is eternal. There is no beginning. There is no middle. There is no end to God. God always is. And so time doesn't mean anything to God. Revelation tells us that a day is like a thousand years to God and a thousand years is like a day. And basically what that means is God isn't... Uh, captured by time he isn't limited by time so when we look at some of the scriptures that speak about how what we do in this life affects the next life what he's trying to God's trying to show us is is that it matters how we choose to practice our faith that we choose to walk the road to discipleship and when we make that choice with all of its perils and struggles and challenges, all of its glorious victories, it is a good choice to make. The first scripture I want to lift up to you uh, is um, God is not mocked. God will not be deceived from Galatians 6, 8. A man will reap what he sows. Now, a lot of people look at life and they say, well, that's not true. This bad person over here Seemed to live a full life. He was rich till the end. And then he died. But if God isn't limited by time. Neither is his justice. And so justice for God. Can be handled in the eternity of time. And justice for the disciple. Is especially handled in the eternity of time. So nothing is wasted with God. Nothing. Whatever we do to serve the Lord. To glorify God. To, to witness to the power of Jesus Christ in our lives adds to our life eternal. We reap what we sow. So what are you as a disciple uh, sowing? What kind of life are you sowing? Are you sowing a life of, 
of, of faithful worship and faithful prayer and faithful, faithful Bible study, uh, faithful giving and faithful service and faithful witness and faithful care and protection over your spiritual family. These are the things that Jesus taught people to do as disciples, his disciples. We will reap what we sow. If the Christian chooses not to sow into any of these areas, then their harvest will be much less. Jesus told this in the form of a parable known as the parable of the sower. He says, what kind of soil will you be? Will you be like the rocky path? And when the seed of the gospel falls in the rocky path, the birds just snatch it away and you have no faith and it's gone. Perilous thing, the thing that I talked about at the very beginning of the sermon is how hard it is to walk through the valley of the shadow of death without faith. That's like the seed that falls on the rocky on the path itself. Then there's the, the seed that falls in the rocky soil and it springs up. But it has no roots. Like so many I know who have gotten faith, confessed their life in Jesus Christ. Aha, I have the answer of life. But then when the cares of the world come along, their, their faith is quickly lost and the sun scorches it away. Or there's the seed that falls amongst the weeds. And it grows up, but it bears no fruit, no harvest, because the weeds choke it out, the cares of the world choke it out, and they have a, a double-minded commitment. I, I'm committed to Lord Jesus over here, but I'm also committed to the world. And that double-minded commitment reduces or eliminates any harvest. And then Jesus said there is the harvest where the seed can fall into the good soil, and it can produce a harvest of 30, 60, or 100 fold. Which will you be? We reap what we sow. So as the disciple uh, journeys, they need to keep that in mind for a God that is not limited by time. The second thing that I, I want to lift up for us as disciples on the journey of faith is that uh, because God is the author of of creation and is omnipotent. He knows all things and our, our vision is limited. So there are many times when we have to just trust God. Trust God with everything because there's going to be things that happen in our lives and we're going to say, I don't understand that. But God does. I love Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13. They're not read very often because they're not the best part. The, the poem of love, it talks about love is patient and love is kind. It's not jealous or boastful or arrogant or rude. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem. It's one of my favorite, it is, and a lot of people's favorite and best definition of what love is. But there's this one section in 1 Corinthians 13 that a lot of people look at and they say, I don't know if I understand that. And it's the part about the mirror. Um, Paul writes, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so what I, Paul is challenging us to do in this section with the mirror, that we only see dimly now. There are so many things we do not understand. So we need to focus on faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is is love. And the disciple is not called to understand all of these things. They are called to love. When we do this, it improves, it increases the harvest that God can do with our lives. And it, it shatters, the, it slays the giant of death so that it has no bearing on us because we don't think about our own deaths. We think about love, faith, and hope realizing that one day we, may, we can't see clearly now what's going on like God can, but one day we will see God face to face. So uh, that's, that's uh, a, a number of things that I've lifted up for the disciple to keep in mind to slay the giant of death. Uh, one more thing that I want to lift up for us uh, to help us clarify what the battle is and how we can win it is from... Um, Revelation 14, 13, he says, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I love that because 
What that that's reinforcing all this um, sermon has to say about not thinking about death, not being concerned or afraid about death. That that when we work in the Lord, our deeds are remembered by God, and they follow us into the next life. And as they follow us into the next life, God will use all those deeds and will bless us in the life to come. How? I don't know. All I know is this. When God showers a blessing down upon us, it is an amazing blessing. And I want all the blessing I can get. Now, I want to paint a picture for you. In prayer this morning, I was praying about this, this idea of the disciple and how he walks his road of discipleship through his life till he comes to, to death and then enters into heaven. And God reminded me of the mountain of salvation. This is a picture of, uh, that a lot of people have of God where there's this giant mountain and, and um, everybody, everybody is walking up the mountain on their own chosen path. And when they reach the top of the mountain, what they've in effect done is they've reached the end of their life and they get to go into heaven because God loves everybody and God does love everybody and therefore everybody will be welcome into heaven no matter how they get there. That is not biblical. The Bible does not describe at all that we can get to heaven any way we want. But in this, this modern conception of what religious faith is, it is that we can make a religion of our own choosing. So as we walk up the mountain, up to the top of the mountain where heaven is and finish our lives and God then welcomes us into heaven, we can have a little bit of Christianity, but, but not any of the bad parts, not of the parts about judgment or any of that. We can have a little bit of Eastern mysticism. Maybe we'll pull in a little bit of the occult because that's really cool. And we make this religion of our own uh, design that we like and God likes it, therefore, too, because we like it. And to heaven, we arrive. That has nothing to do with what the Bible or any other religion in the world teaches about experiencing salvation. That is a modern, modern conception uh, from the universalist church. All right. So as I was praying into this scene, God says, let me replace that mountain of salvation with the mountain of discipleship. He says, I want my disciples to think of the mountain just the same with heaven at the top. And all people are milling around at the base of the mountain. So a lot of them think they're walking up the mountain, but unless they've confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are fooling themselves and they're just wandering around aimlessly. Their lives are beaten around by the winds of fate. They lie to themselves and they deceive themselves and they listen to Satan's lies a lot. And they think they're achieving one thing when they're really achieving nothing except perhaps eternal damnation. And I, live that, I leave that up to God. God gets to deal with who gets saved and who gets damned. That's out of my pay grade. All I know is in my vision, these people were wandering aimlessly. And then when a person confesses Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there is a great celebration. And they go up to the top of the mountain. And they get to meet Jesus and they get to welcome Jesus into their life. And everything is different now, except Jesus says, now, it's not your time to come to heaven. But when it is your time to come to heaven, you get to come in. Now, I want you to go back to the base of the mountain. And be my hands and my feet. And my voice and minister to all those people that are wandering. And you're going to be in two places at once. You're not only going to be with all those people, but you're also going to be walking up the mountain. That's the mountain of discipleship. And as you walk up the mountain, you're going to experience all kinds of challenges. I think of about the when I was a young man and I was in a worship service, worshiping God, and I heard God speak to me and call me into the ministry. That was a very important part in my journey up the mountain. But I was still also down at the bottom being a part of the struggling masses. And as I learned more and more about who Jesus is, how to love better, how to be more humble, how to pray and read scripture and serve and witness, I'm walking up the mountain. The journey of my life, the journey of discipleship. 
But Jesus says, I I want you to remember this. I'm not just sending you down to the foot of the mountain to serve all those people by yourself. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to be there with you and I'm going to guide you into all of that. And so we have this wonderful experience with Jesus that's hard. There are times when it's really hard. But the victories are so sweet. Think about your life when you've had the greatest victories in your life. Aren't they after the hardest things you've accomplished? But especially if God has guided you through things that are, that are even bigger than you thought you could ever handle. And then in those times, God got you through and brought you to the other side. And you think to yourself, that was hard. I never want to do that again. But I sure would never want to miss it either. It completely changed me. Have you ever had those experiences? That's the journey of discipleship. Up the mountain until we get to heaven and our life ends and God welcomes us into his throne room and Jesus says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. I've given you responsibility over small things. Now I will give you responsibility over great things. Come and enter into the joy that I have prepared for you. That's the life of the disciple. Death is just a marker. It is not a giant that can stop us. It's the marker between life here and the life to come. And whatever God has prepared for us, we can be absolutely certain That it is an eternity that is amazing. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we are all at different places when it comes to death. Some of us have already had to deal with death. Death of loved ones, death of parents, death of children. Some of us are looking at dealing with our own death. We know about death. We know how frightening it can be. How lonely and sad we can become. Lord, help us to remember that the loneliness and the sadness is a part of grief. And that we can call on your name to help us heal. But that death is not to be feared by the faithful. For the promises you give us in scripture, the promise that you are not limited by time, that that all the things we do, all the ways we love in this life, will have a bearing on the next life, and we can trust it all to you. So Lord, we lift up to you now our prayers about where death sits in our road of discipleship. Are we afraid? Or have we learned to live with death and say it's just that that pause before the, the flowering of life everlasting? Lord, hear us now as we lift up our prayers and consider where we are as disciples. Hear our prayers. Oh, Lord, the communion table is set before us. Before we take and eat and drink, we need to prepare ourselves through faith. I invite everybody that is a part of this worship service to renew your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If there's anybody watching this service that has never confessed your faith in Jesus Christ, then I invite you to do it today for the first time. Lord, hear us. Hear our prayers. To you be all glory and power and honor this day and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. 
If you are someone who gave your life to Christ for the first time while watching this uh, worship service, I invite you to reach out to me through the website that I may reach back with guidance for first steps on the road of salvation up the mountain of discipleship. Now we come to this holy table to remember that Christ lived for us Preach the good news of the gospel to the people he loved. He told them about the forgiveness of sins, the promise of eternal life. He was a friend of sinners. Yet he was murdered by those he loved, hung on the cross to die. But he is not dead. He has risen to rule the world and he is still a friend of sinners. And he reigns in power for us this day and forevermore that we might know without any doubt that our sins are are forgiven and he has died for our salvation and been raised victorious over sin death and evil i invite the worship team if you will to get the elements of bread and cup at this time and i'm going to pray over uh, the elements that i have on the communion table and over the elements that you have with you wherever you are let us bow our heads in prayer let us pray Great God Almighty, we give you thanks and praise that we can all come around this communion table from wherever we are in the world, whatever race we are, whatever denomination, this table breaks down walls between people. It is the table that brings unity to all of life. It is the table of Jesus Christ. We thank you that Christ is risen to rule the world. We thank you that the promise you give us that we'll get a resurrection body for the life to come, you showed us through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we need not fear death. And this communion celebration is a concrete symbol of our victory over sin and death and evil. Bless this bread. Bless this cup. That as we eat and drink, we will live our lives as a living sacrifice to you. Glorifying your name in all we think, say, and do. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, This bread is my body, broken for you. Jesus calls us to eat in remembrance of him. I invite each of us to take our communion bread now in remembrance of Jesus Christ. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus calls us to drink in remembrance of him. I invite all worshipers to drink in remembrance of Jesus Christ. As often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again for us in glory. Let us bow our heads in prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. O oh Lord, how can we thank you enough for the great sacrifice that you have made for us? You allowed the three nails of the Romans to hold you on the cross, not because of the nails, but because of your love. You allowed humanity to kill you, the king who stepped off his throne, the throne of heaven, to join us in this fallen world 
that we could be set free, set completely free from all of our sins. We give you thanks and praise for your humility shown to us in the cross. And because of the cross, God has greatly exalted your name above every name. That we might always have the victory over sin and death and evil. That as believers, we need not fear death. And we can turn to you in our times of grief and find the victory, healing, new life. Oh, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. In your precious name, we ask this prayer. Amen. We close with our final hymn from around the world. This is a Jamaican melody, and I hope you enjoy the syncopation. Let us talents and tongues employ, reaching out with a shout of joy. Bread is broken, the wine is poured, Christ is spoken and seen and heard. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loaves abound. Christ is able to make us one, at the table he sets a tone. Teaching people to live to bless, love in word and in deed express. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loaves abound. Jesus calls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt, gives us love to tell, bread to share, God Emmanuel everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loaves abound. Amen. Amen. We come to the benediction and invite everybody to raise your hands up, especially if you're in a room with other people. But any, even so, you're going to raise your hands up to send a blessing out to the people around you in the room you're worshiping and the people you love and the people in your your uh, c- community, your neighborhood, the blessing goes out. A blessing of love from God's people. And now, people of God, go into the world in peace and be of good courage. Render to no one evil for evil, but strengthen the weak, help the afflicted, honor all that you meet, and go forth in the power of our Lord's love. And now, may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love our Father in heaven, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit Be with us all forever and ever. Alleluia. Amen.